Thank you for joining us for the 12th Annual College and University Educators Workshop. I'm Irina Fasquianas, Vice President for the National Program and Outreach. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations Outreach Initiative is dedicated to being a resource for educators, all of you, uh, to help uh, students better understand the world and the foreign policy choices facing the United States and other countries. So we're delighted to have you with us in person representing 49 states in Washington, D.C. I will not tell you which state we're missing. You can figure that out. You can look through the program with all your bios, and whoever gets a prize might get something, you know, guesses may get a prize. Um, and we are live streaming this, so welcome to all anybody who's tuning in virtually. Over the course of this workshop, we have a terrific lineup of panels that will focus on the conflict in the Middle East, societal implications of AI, climate change and implementation, as well as discussion groups on a variety of regional topics. And the purpose of this workshop is to give you the opportunity to explore the wide array of CFR and foreign affairs resources. You had an opportunity to um, speak with representatives um, at, during the reception. I hope you enjoyed that. Participate in expert briefings and share best practices with each other. So we hope you will take advantage of the networking. Um, and before I turn to tonight's discussion on the role of the world, the U.S. in the world, I would like to thank my colleagues Sarah McMurdy and Deanna Hines for their work, and of course the whole national program and outreach team, as well as many people around the building that you can't see, events, facilities, and, and many more. Um, it takes a village, as somebody once said. So with that, I invite my uh, distinguished panel to uh, join me on the stage. Zhang Yuan, Zoe Liu, Farah Pandith, Nate Shankhan, and Daniel Kurtz Phelan, editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine and host of the Foreign Affairs Interview podcast, will moderate tonight's discussion. And then we can continue it amongst ourselves over dinner. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan right. to take it away. Um, thank you, Irina. Um, good evening, all. It's a pleasure to kick off what I am sure will be a fascinating and useful series of conversations over the next uh, 24 hours or so for all of you. I'm Dan kurtz -Fallon. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs. We've got a fantastic lineup here for um, what should be a very wide-ranging discussion of the state of US foreign policy and the US role in the world. We could spend probably a full hour on the topics that each of them will address, but we will try to um, uh, have a, a, a fully um, a, a rich kind of 10 minutes or so as we start uh, with each of them, and then I will go to all of you for questions. So please um, keep those in mind as, uh, as we talk. Let me very briefly introduce the three of them, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Um, immediately to my left is Zoe Liu. Zoe Liu. She is a fellow for China Studies here at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she has done some really important and incisive work on the Chinese economy. Remind me the title of your book, which I should, I should have on hand. I have two. Which one you were talking the, about? The most recent one, the new one, the new one. Uh, uh, is, the latest one is uh, Sovereign Funds, How the Communist Sovereign Party of Funds, China yes. Finances Global Ambitions. Thank you. Um, so, so we will talk a bit about the state of the Chinese economy, but also about the U.S.-China relationship uh, more broadly. And then to her left is Farah Pandit. She is also a senior fellow here at CFR. Uh, her work now is on countering violent extremism, um, and her, her post at CFR uh, focuses on that work, but she has had a uh, distinguished career in the U.S. government uh, before coming to CFR, including as the, the first ever, do I have that right, the first ever special representative to Muslim communities in the Obama administration, but also worked um, in the George W. Bush administration on the National Security Council and then at USAID earlier on in her career. Um, so covers a, a very wide variety of, of, of topics in those capacities and in her current capacity. And then last but not least, uh, the only one of us who is not employed by CFR, Nate Schenken. <laughs> There's still uh, time. He, that's right, that's right. Uh, there are, we're, we're hiring an intern at Foreign Affairs, so <laughs> we can look for that. Um, he's Senior Director of Research at Freedom House, uh, and he has done, I should say, great work for Foreign Affairs over the last few years, including um, a really path-breaking piece, which is still, we still go back to periodically on um, transnational repression, which I think was the, uh, certainly the first place I read about that, but was a, a fascinating piece. Um, and there are a slew of others. So um, I will um, try to resist the temptation to spend an hour with each one of them. And um, we'll start with Nate, actually, and then, and then work our way back in this direction. You know, Freedom House, I think, is probably best known for the work that you all do, much of which you lead on the state of global democracy, the Freedom in the World Report. You have a new one out 
um, as you look at both the most recent report, but also the trajectory of democracy globally over the last couple of decades, give us a sense of where we are and where those trends are, but also why you think we've gotten to this point. What, to what extent is the change in the United States a driver? To what extent is the, the change in the United States a symptom? Mm -hmm. What's the diagnosis, but also um, uh, give us a sense of that trajectory? Sure. Um, so just for this audience, I know that this is an audience filled with many political scientists, but maybe some others who aren't. Um, Freedom House is an organization that does this annual index, Freedom in the World, that we've been doing since 1973. We cover political rights and civil liberties in every country and territory in the world. Kind of an insane task that was set out 50 years ago by someone before I was born. Um, so in this year's survey, which we just released uh, two weeks ago, what we have is the 18th year of consecutive net decline uh, in global democracy. So more declines than improvements. Uh, 52 declines against 21 improvements. Um, when we measure democracy and we talk about democracy, there's obviously a lot of really rich debate about this topic globally and in political science. We take a pretty thick version. So we look at this in a, in a fairly thick, robust definition of how rights are experienced within a given territory, as opposed to some thinner definitions that could be based on purely yes, no questions like elections or presence of freedom of expression, et cetera. Um, well, so when we look at those declines, uh, some of the key trends that are driving them, again, at the very macro level globally, um, electoral manipulation, so manipulation of elections and attempts to short circuit electoral processes, um, armed conflict, including coups and civil wars, but also return of wars of conquest, which is obviously very relevant in the uh, <coughs> Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and last, perhaps most complicated, and we could talk about it amongst this group, um, the rejection of pluralism as a principle. So this is a, this is a trend that we can observe across many different, I would say, cultural heritages and regional variations in which you have leaders and political movements that are rejecting the idea of pluralism, rejecting the idea that societies are made up of diversity of viewpoints, diversity of identities, and that those should be uh, reconciled or at least addressed through some kind of institutionalized political process that produces an outcome, essentially through liberal democracy. So we see kind of affirmative rejection of that idea uh, growing across. So those are the three trends I would highlight. Um, if we talk about these 18 years of what many call the democratic recession, I think the, the, the first point of context I would emphasize, which is also consistent with other surveys like varieties of democracy, um, is that this is a recession, not a depression. So when this started in 1973, 30% um, of the world's countries were rated as free in freedom in the world. Um, in the peak, uh, 2002 to 2008 at this point, um, which comes at the end of what we now consider the third wave of democratization, that was 46%. Um, the number now is 42%. So you have this kind of curve, right, of increasing freedom and then a, a dip, which is where we are now. But it's not a collapse. Um, I do think that's important and that's consistently found by us, by other political scientists, and we have to keep that in mind when we talk about what the recession consists of. Um, the second part, I would say, in terms of when we go into our data and when we look at how we've studied it, um, the, bulk of the, the bulk of the attention is on the recession in the democracies. And that's understandable. We're all in democracies, or, or you know, in this group, in this room, literally. We're arguing about it. The bulk of the recession is actually in what we call not free countries. Um, so the average change among free and partly free countries in that 18-year recession is 1% decline. Uh, the average change in the not free cohort is 24%. So you have kind of a bottoming out, really, um, at the bottom of the scale of authoritarian uh, governance. And that's very important to keep in mind. It's important to think about from a policy perspective of, you know, how are you, if you're going to reverse the democratic recession, what are you really talking about reversing, right? Um, that said, it's not to say there aren't plenty of problems in free countries. Um, we certainly see that as being an issue. Um, in 2023, 18% of the free countries had declines. Um, there's a whole slew of concerns. Obviously, elections uh, and election denialism or rejection of kind of peaceful transfers of power is a major issue. Um, freedom of assembly issues, corruption, um, violence and physical security are major issues, um, increasingly in free countries, um, and attacks on judicial independence and due process. The US falls within all of that. Um, I would say, uh, and the U.S. decline has been nine points in the last decade, um, from 93 to 82, uh, or sorry, from 
from 92 to 83, apologies, uh, within the last decade, which is by freedom in the world standards, I guess I would say medium large uh, in terms of decline. You know, this isn't at the top of our 10 year declines, but it's not at the bottom. Um, and yeah, the, the major concerns in the US that we've highlighted consistently are unequal treatment um, in terms of the, the, the treatment of different citizens or different persons on US territory and how they experience interactions with the justice system or with the state um, and, and their access to justice or access to voting, access to rights. Um, and then second, the intensifying gridlock and dysfunction in actual governance, which again, to go back to that beginning point about thickness, we consider that a part of uh, how political rights and civil liberties are manifested on the ground for people. Um, so when you have a system that is congealing or stagnating in gridlock, like we have in the United States right now, that is weighing down now on your ability to realize your rights. And, and to what extent does your work and Freedom House's work isolate causes of that recession? Can you, I mean, we can yeah. look at, you know, we can go back to the, the mm -hmm. Iraq war, the uh, rise of mm -hmm. China, to social media. I mean, there are lots of, right. of possible causes over that period. Are you able to isolate any of those when you look at your data? I think it's very difficult to isolate it just from the data because it's all wrapped up with itself. Like what are the exogenous and endogenous, how do you disentangle the exogenous and the endogenous within that equation? Um, I think we find it, when, when we look at the issue of, again, to look at it across a 50 year time frame instead of just the 18 year, I think we would have to say that there is uh, a kind of, there, there was a major shock that took place within the system. This is sort of Seva Gunitsky's idea of the aftershocks um, kind of theory about a hegemonic shock that took place with decolonization later with the end of the Cold War. And that there was then a long process uh, or rap rapid but also broad process of democratization that took place. And now we see that actually rolling back in a number of areas where maybe the grounds for uh, steady democratization or consolidation of democrat democracy were not as firm in terms of the economic uh, conditions, in terms of perhaps social conditions, or in, in terms of um, absence of war, absence of conflict, things that you kind of need in order to then settle. At the same time, the shock was real and the, the consolidation was real. So like a lot of, again, to go back, a lot of the gains out of that third wave are real, right? We have a number of countries all over the world that were not democratic in 1973 that are now democratic and have remained that way um, for a long period of time. Um, so that's more of a structural kind of explanation, mm -hmm. I'd say. I think it's, it's very difficult, I think, then to go and, and dig into the things that we're most anxious about in democracies and tie them specifically into one thing, although we continue to be very anxious about them, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that was a cheerier answer than I thought we would get on this entire <laughs> panel, so thank you for that. Um, Nate, let me ask you one more question before uh, moving on to the other two. You know, so much, as, as we go back to that, the end of the Cold War and look at the trajectory of American foreign policy, over that period in the Clinton administration, through the, the George W. Bush administration, and really into the Obama administration, you had um, some form of democracy promotion or democracy mm -hmm. support really as a centerpiece of American foreign policy. It obviously took very different forms across those administrations, but that was a, a, a through line. I think we're in a different paradigm mm -hmm. now, and probably starting with Trump, but I think you see Biden talks about democracy and authoritarianism a lot, but you don't see um, particularly strong policies when it comes mm -hmm. to democracy promotion in US foreign policy today, and we guess we can, we can, we yeah. can debate that. Feel free to disagree with that, but that would, that would be my, my assessment. Do you see, when you look at the American foreign policy debate now, we're obviously uh, just starting a general election, do you see an appetite for returning to some form of uh, uh, putting democracy at the center of American foreign policy, or do you think that that is a kind of relic of a hmm. you know, kind of unipolar era that we're simply out of now? Yeah, I think it would, what I would say is that I think we're arriving at a place where when we talk about democracy at the center of foreign policy, we're talking about it in a more holistic and concrete way that is both more accurate and more applicable to what we're really doing. To make that specific, I mean, when we say democracy promotion, what do we really mean? We mean USAID doing democracy and governance work. We mean the National Endowment for Democracy, um, the other core institutes, organizations like Freedom House receiving grants to do programming. Um, but that's only one tiny piece of a democracy-centered foreign policy. And I think if we looked at US foreign policy from that perspective over a longer period of time that predates USAID, that predates NED and all of this, we'd say you know, some of the high water marks here are of an internationalist US foreign policy that really did 
think about democracy both as something that we promote and support overseas, but also is very important to Americans at home. Um, and I do think that there is a kind of shift happening um, around making sure that Americans support an international role for America in the world because it's good for them. Um, you know, it's a very I do think that's a pragmatic reaction as well to Trump and to the Trump administration's successful critiques of neoliberalism, of deindustrialization, and you're seeing a big swing back. You know, include that's continuous now, right? Um, the rhetoric, sort of the the heat around it is different, but if you look at the way this administration is pursuing essentially industrial policy on certain issues, uh, is pursuing um, some forms of protectionism on certain issues, those are all in continuity with these conversations that I think Trump kind of broke wide open mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by shattering a previous consensus. And so I would put democracy as foreign policy within that context rather than looking at it narrowly within either the freedom agenda or another version of kind of more narrow democracy promotion per se. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of the piece that Samantha Power wrote in, in Foreign Affairs where she, you know, who, someone who had been at least associated with the kind of soaring rhetoric of the 90s yeah. and then the, the first part of the Obama administration, and this piece was about demo supporting democracy, but it was very much about inequality and very kind right. of focused economic policy. It was a very different tone from what you would have gotten in 2009 or, or, yeah. or the, the 1990s. Um, for, let, 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 me, let me turn to you um, uh, and, and ask you to do, I think, a version of, of what I asked Nate to do with your work. You have worked on extremism in various forms in a variety of contexts. Uh, there was a time probably 15 years ago and much of that was focused on uh, violent extremism in the rest of the world. A lot of that has now um, become, uh, come home in certain ways that we're seeing uh, uh, a lot of those challenges at home. Give us a sense of the trajectory of hate and extremism domestically as you track it, as you tracked it over yeah. recent years. And to what extent as you look, reflect back on your work globally, in what ways is it similar? In what ways are there kind of tools that you would have deployed abroad that you're now think are relevant at home? And to what extent is this kind of a sui generis uh, development? Such an important question, and, and good evening to everybody. Um, we're going to give you some really difficult and um, sobering uh, things to think about this evening, I think, and, and I think are very connected to what Nate has just talked about. Um, it is no surprise to any of you that there is a change in the way America feels um, around us and them, around identity, around belonging, around trust. Um, these are things that may be trends that we would have imagined to happen in other parts of the world because of difficult situations. But um, in, in earnest, we as, as, as people who have been looking at the, the threat of um, terrorists or the threat of violent extremists, we really began that in terms of a national conversation on 9-11, obviously. Um, and so our pivot was overseas. Um, something was happening really bad with some group called Al-Qaeda. We didn't know really that much about it, even though we had heard about it with the USS Cole, even though, of course, they tried to attack the, the World Trade Center in 93. Um, but nobody had really understood that anything like that could be a wave that had hit um, America. We certainly could not comprehend uh, at that time that we would have um, an ISIS or things that happened afterwards. So I think our, our concentration on the threat level was obviously overseas. It was on stopping the growth of the funding for these organizations, the ability for them to get together. I mean, it was very old school terrorism kind of thinking. Um, but there began to be a, a change in the way we began to look at these groups around not just what they were doing on the ground, but the, the power that they had to radicalize. What was actually happening? How could they build their ideological soldiers? That shift really happened around 2003 or so when we had sort of begun that establishment of going after al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan, looking at what was happening in Iraq. In the Bush administration, the so-called um, war of ideas is what it was called, the ideological dimension of the war, us versus them. And to be honest with you, um, there was no conception that we were going to have a bleed of the ideology overseas coming to the United States or vice versa. And I'm sorry to say to you that in 2024, we have a situation where it is more dangerous than we could have ever imagined. Uh, it is not a fake imagination. It is real. Ideologies that are coming from other parts of the world are impacting American, Americans now uh, very, in every possible way, which I hope we'll get into. But also, unfortunately, things that are homegrown, that are 
very American in their building and their construction, are now, guess what, helping really horrific, horrific things happening overseas. So we have a back and forth that's going. So one of the things I'd say, really very importantly in terms of a shift, is one, the scope and the level of this. You know, this was not something that's contained in another part of the world. And frankly, Americans were not really that concerned because it was on somebody else's shore. It wasn't going to come and hit home. 9-11, of course, changed all that. But then in the subsequent years, it, it wasn't just a 7-7 in the UK. It wasn't just the Madrid bombings. It wasn't just thing after thing after thing that happened around the world. But we began to see um, a parallel structure in the United States where an, uh, Christian nationalism was rising, hate groups in the United States from the violent far right, the violent far left, left today. We have every kind and flavor of hate that exists. So it can be gender-based. It can be sexual-based. It can be um, uh, around heritage and ethnicity. It can be around religion. Pick your thing. There is a way in which this is happening. And unfortunately, it isn't just that it's happening. It's that it's happening at a pace and a scale that we were not prepared for. Um, we have a situation where trust has eroded across America anyway, for a lot of different reasons, that plays into this issue of what people are hearing and feeling is real in terms of what they see on their smart devices. Um, so with the, with the surge of social media, we obviously, and I know we're going to get into a little bit more about that, but um, that's part of the reason why the scale and the pace can be as, um, as profound as it is. But there are two more elements to this that I think um, are important that we didn't think about. Um, so 2020, 2003, we began to think of the war of ideas, the ideological component, all of the pieces. Another way of describing that is soft power, what's happening ideologically, non-kinetic. Um, but here's the thing. It is not contained to the demographic that we thought we had false perceptions of who was going to be attracted to this kind of us versus them ideology. It isn't just a bunch of um, men who look and, and might be a particular ethnicity or background. We're talking about uh, millennials. We're talking about Gen Z. And we're talking about Gen Alpha, who are as young as seven and eight years old, who are being radicalized online by groups like Atomwaffen. OK, so we have a spread demographically. It is not just a bunch of guys. We see women who are getting radicalized as well, women playing a very strong role in the radicalization effort that's taking place. And then the third thing that I'd say, and there, there are many more, but um, just in terms of how we think about this, there is a structure within the foreign policy land of how we approach uh, non, uh, state actors. We are not as robust in the non-state actor component, and certainly around the ideology of hate and extremism. So we've been slow to the game. We have not put the money in the way we need to. We don't have, even though there's so much change that's happened in, in the years since 9-11 in terms of the organizational capacity globally to think about these things, we aren't playing the best game that we could play because we haven't gone all in. And it isn't just the United States. There's no country on Earth that has gone all in. So we're, in a, we're on our back foot as the surge of hate is rising in our country and around the world. Um, and we are in a very tender position because of the, um, the fact that radicalization happens both offline and online, and we can't contain it. And since the, the title of this panel is The Role of the United States in the World, say a bit more about the, about the export mm -hmm. of, of extremism that, is, that begins in America or is developed in America to the rest of the world and the way that that is intersecting with other global developments uh, that might come back to uh, affect foreign policymakers here? So there's a cross-pollinization in the way in which um, people learn about how to be successful in radicalizing. Uh, the generation that is not anybody in this room, by the way, that it, are digital natives who understand mm -hmm. with fluidity how to manage um, the message, how to build a narrative that's very compelling to a 16-year-old girl versus a 16-year-old guy, whether that person is in Oregon or that person is in Malaysia. They know how to um, make bespoke messages that work perfectly for the moment and the time. Um, they are using platforms across, um, across, you know. When you talk to US policy um, makers on Capitol Hill and you hear them speak about this, they're talking about Facebook. We're talking about things that are far, you know, you are laughing because you know that your, your students do not use Facebook, right? I mean, let's get real. So we are, we are, 
we are behind mm -hmm. behind the game. So what, what are we doing? We're seeing the way um, they share identity, what it means to be a Christian nationalist, what it means to be pure, what, in, what that identity um, means to them, how you use symbols. Symbols have transferred from the United States to other parts of the world and the other, other way back. You see um, memes and videos that are, that are shared, how you do things, what you want to do. The messaging around um, purity, the messaging around um, uh, you know, um, making sure that you like certain uh, countries, like Russia, for example, may start in parts of the United States and go to other parts of the world. So we are, we're seeing a back and forth that we, I don't think, expected, to be honest with you. Um, and at some point, America is going to be, in my view, a state sponsor of terrorism, because it will be so clear that what we did over here ended up in another part of the world, just the way in Norway, when that horrific event happened, um, and had the killing of the, of the summer camp, you guys will all remember this, um, how manifestos travel around the world and ignite passion. Look at what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand. I will remind everybody that in 2006, and you will remember when I tell you the Danish cartoon crisis, you remember that? Okay. We never would have imagined in a million years that a cartoon character, character cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad would happen in Denmark and be transferred around the world so much so and become so dangerous that US embassies had to be protected in a different way. We didn't understand what viral meant at that time. It was the first time we suddenly understood that something that happened in Copenhagen could have an effect on a life in Kabul. People lost their lives because of that cartoon. Now, that's simplistic compared to what we're seeing today. So when I say we are exporting or anything could happen at any moment, um, a video, a, a cartoon, uh, a symbol, a manifesto that could actually ignite passion and direction and focus for an individual in a part of the world we wouldn't have imagined. Let me ask you to put on um, your Middle East policy hat very mm -hmm. quickly, because we um, should, um, should this come up in questions as well, but address the, the, the war in Gaza and the Middle East mm -hmm. more broadly. Um, I think the, the Biden administration has a theory of what it hopes will happen in the Middle East. Um, it it you know, hopes to create a political horizon with the Palestinians to get back to normalization. Um, with the between Israel and the rest of the region, and to find some kind of uh, um, sustainable end to the war in Gaza, with given the you know terrible humanitarian costs there, do you think that it's likely to, to pull that off? Do you see a, a way forward for U.S. policy that could turn this into at least something of a new beginning, both for uh, Israel and the Palestinians and for the region more broadly? In the short term, let's say in the medium term. No, I don't. Um, there, are too many, there are too many components to this that are uncertain. Um, how broad does this war get in the Middle East? Is Lebanon going to get, get pulled into it? Um, how, how is aid going to be dispersed? How many more lives are going to be affected um, in the territory um, of Gaza? Um, how bad is the hostage situation going to be? Will Hamas release the hostages? How far will Israel go? There's so many uh, variables that we can't control at this moment. But there are a couple of things that we know for sure which are not trending in the right direction. Um, first of all, um, I think that the, one of the things that, that and I'm this is the, sort of the long-term thing, and I'm saying this from the perspective of somebody who in the Obama administration was tasked in building bridges with Muslim communities around the world. Um, One-fourth of humanity is Muslim. Over a billion of that number are under the age of 30. They are watching things in real time on their phones. There is nothing you can put past them. They are seeing things in their, in, with their own eyes, and they're interpreting it the way people are messaging it to them from communities that are trusted. And that is an unknown for US foreign policymakers because we have not spent time really understanding the nuances of Gen Z and Gen Alpha of Muslims around the world. And that's the piece that I think is a variable that really is going to matter over the, the short, medium, and long term. We can, we can follow up on that in, in the, in the Q&A, but let me get to, to Zoe to talk about um, what remains, I think, one of the, the um, central concerns for U.S. foreign policy, um, and that is, of course, China and the U.S.-China relationship. Um, let's start with the economy. If we'd been having this conversation a few years ago, 
um, we would have been talking about the continued high rates of economic growth in China and the, the uh, uh, challenges that a you know, kind of seemingly ever rising China was going to pose to the United States. There's now been a turn in the debate for the last year or so as people have focused on the challenges to China's growth, demographic, um, Xi Jinping's policies, the other things that seem to be um, weighing down the Chinese economy. Um, you are someone who looks at this with a degree of uh, rigor and empiricism that I think most people in this debate do, do not bring to it. Give us a sense of where, how you see the Chinese economy and how you see the trajectory going forward. Are, is the you know, kind of peak China doomsayers, do they have it closer to right or do you think we'll, we'll see a return to something closer to maybe not you know, 7 or 8% growth, but um, the kind of healthy growth that characterized uh, China over the last couple of decades? Yeah, thank you, Dan, for the uh, sort of question. And first of all, welcome coming to CFR. Thank you for sharing your evening and uh, your, your time with us. Uh, a long, so long, long answer short to your question with regard to do I, do I buy into the peak China theory? I would say no. And the reason I, am, I do not buy into the peak China theory um, is specifically for this a very simple, um, perhaps, back of the envelope calculation. Um, we hear a lot about the chi China's upcoming demographic crisis, but at least in the near term, at least in the near term, uh, the Chinese population is four times of that of the United States. And in order for the Chinese economy in GDP terms to catch up with that of the United States, it simply means that on a per capita GDP level, China only needs to reach that of the one quarter of that of the US. And this is exactly the reason why I think there is still potential for the Chinese economy to reach to the level of the, that of the United States. And if we think about it what, if, in terms of you know, per capita level, right now, if today the Chinese economy reached that of the level of either Greece or Poland, the Chinese economy in terms of GDP size would be bigger than that of the US, as simple as that. But there is a difference between, you know, China has the potential with re versus it actually can get there. And this is where I think uh, I would fall into the category of, or the spectrum of, um, you know, I focus more on the structural challenges rather than, um, you know, the, the one, one man, President Xi Jinping or General Secretary Xi Jinping himself. And the reason is because that I, I tend to use this framework, I've, I've written about it, which is the so-called four Ds. I use this fr framework to think about the Chinese economy, its trajectory, and how it can recover. The four D include, the first D is debt, the second D is demand, the third D is uh, demographic, and then the fourth D is decoupling or de-risking. So a lot of these are both the cyclical and the structural. And on the debt side, now everybody's talking about the Chinese debt and local government debt, in particular the local government financing vehicle, but a lot of this issue can actually be dated all the way back to uh, fund, very important contributing factor would be the 2000, 2008, 2009 during that time in, in terms of driving the China, the, in, in terms of driving global growth, China did the four trillion, uh, four trillion stimulus policy, which created a lot of overcapacity issue. And they have been dealing with that ever since then. The first time that the Chinese uh, government clearly talked about the necessity of addressing overcapacity issue was back in 2015. They literally talked about we have to address overcapacity issue. And at the uh, 2016, the eighth round of US-China uh, strategic and economic dialogue, actually Secretary, uh, Secretary, at that time, the Secretary of Treasury, Jack Lu, went to China, talked with the Chinese counterpart, and uh, talking about the need of the need of US-China jointly work together to address China's overcapacity issues, specifically in the steel sector. And then what ended up happening was 2018 when Trump came in, killed the uh, strategic and economic dialogue, hence paused any opportunity to cooperate on that. So this, a lot of this debt problem can, can be traced back to the same four trillion stimuli. And that is exactly why the Chinese government right now, people have living memories. They realize the need of correcting that bad policy mistake. Therefore, they are not dealing with that. Now, there are people can say that, well, you know, the property sector has a lot of debt. Uh, and yes, property sector debt ties very, very neatly into local government debt problem. There's no, no, no problem with that. But the reason why, again, I do not think this debt moment, this debt issue at the property sector level 
is going to become China's dilemma moment is for two reasons. The first reason is that, on the one hand, a lot of these troubled property, pro pro property developers, they are actually uh, private property developers. If you look at the 10 largest pro property developer in China in t today, both in terms of uh, volume and value sa sa sales, as well as in terms of land acquisition, the eight out of the 10 largest one now are state owned. And the second reason why I don't think this is going to be, going to be China's lame moment is also because of the fact that China actually had a playbook to address banking crisis. And it just so happened that a lot of these troubled property, private property developers, their, their share of uh, debt in terms of bank loans is a tiny little bit in terms of the overall China's bank loan sector. And if China were able to deal with and restructure the state-owned commercial banks back in early 2000s, they have this ready-to-go playbook. Therefore, this is not going to, they know how to deal with the upcoming, uh, looming banking crisis. This is not going to be China's banking uh, lemon crisis. But that is a problem in the sense that if the, debt, the growth of debt is faster than the GDP growth, that becomes a problem. And this is exactly the problem that China needs to deal with now. And uh, there, I, I, I tend to think that China now has a, um, has a debt addiction problem in the sense that uh, in order to retire existing stock of debt, you have to literally issue new debt in order to address that problem. And on the other hand, China also uh, is a country that addicted to industrial policies. And the use of industrial policy is very much in the nature of giving preferential, or in other words, uh, discriminatory bank loans to prioritize the sector. In other words, a lot of this problem is going to, again, lead to overcapacity. Previously, it was property market, and then it was steel, cement. And now, you are talking about EVs, the solar panel, and the batteries. So this is a problem that China literally needs to deal with. And if, if uh, the economy, if the political will is there to sacrifice growth, in order to achieve structural adjustment in exchange for a higher quality growth, I think China's, the Chinese economy can still achieve its potential. But at this, it takes a lot of incentive alignment between local government and the central government, as well as all these different SOEs. And I just do not see that happening. Okay. Now that's that. The second part in terms of demand, that comes from two aspects, international or export, and then the other part would be uh, domestic demand. Now, uh, I guess this is an audience that I do not have to explain that China's trade with the West actually declined, right? Um, although we talk a lot about the declining Chinese export to the United States and to the European, to the, the entire Europe, but if you look at the numbers, by 2023, Chinese export to Europe and uh, to United States added together is about $1.2 trillion. And that is bigger than the economy of either Saudi Arabia or Netherlands. That's just the, the, the share of trade. In other words, China is very much trade dependent, and in particular, trade dependent to the West. Now, uh, God forbid if there is another Trump administration, uh, you know, they, they obviously the, the trade share contribution to Chinese GDP is going to shrink. But the bigger drag on the Chinese GDP growth going forward, again, is, is domestic consumption. The government has been talking about promoting domestic consumption, in particular household consumption for a long period of time. And here they say there is a statistical clarification I have to talk about. When China talked about promoting domestic consumption, they literally include state-led investment as part of the bigger aggregated domestic consumption. But that's not really the problem, right? It's not the government's investment that is not driving the, the, the economy. It's the lack of household consumption. Oh, at a global level, you know, on, on par, uh, household consumption as a percent of GDP is around 60%. But for China, it's about 38%. So it's like a chronically under-consumed economy. And now people talk about, well, why Chinese households don't, don't spend? Uh, starting from December, uh, December 2022, as well as last year, the Chinese government put out a series of uh, consumption promotion plans. But still, Chinese household do not spend. Well, part of the reason is because there is a lack of confidence, and part of the reason is because there is a lack of a social security net, and then ultimately there is, out fundamentally, job security is not there. And a lot of this job security ties into de-risking that I'm going to delve into, but before I go there, I wanted to talk about uh, demographics. 
So the demographic challenge for the Chinese economy comes both in terms of the near term and, and, and long term. We all know about the long term you know, in terms of oh, you know, shrinking labor, labor premium and, and so on and so forth. But in the near term, I think the real challenge is that slow, lower family formation rate as, and, uh, lower, uh, and a slower growing population simply means the demand for housing is going to decline. And housing is about 30% of the GDP. So now, you know, you now realize, well, there is a reason uh, why President Xi Jinping now strongly encourages every Chinese, uh, Chinese couple. Okay. No, 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 one, one kid is not enough. You have to have three. And that is like a literally patriotic education, right? You have to have three children. But again, without support for women, without support for, uh, for, for, the, for social security, people simply won't do that. And then you also have this sentiment, you know, Farah and Nate talking about sentiment, talking about the radicalization of, of women. If women realize that they are in the system that is systematically disproportionately uh, discriminated against, both in terms of a family, a share, family burden sharing, in terms of labor market, they would not be incentivized to give children. And in particular, there is also this predominant, a growing sentiment among Chinese young couple, thinking that, well, the world is so cruel. Why am I going to have a kid and let my kid suffer? And then, um, then this, now, now let me sort of related to these demographics to talk about decoupling or de-risking. Decoupling or de-risking directly contribute to, you know, shrinking export, but then on the other hand, people can make the argument to say, well, China is developing an alternative trading system, China will trade more with developing countries. But I do not think China trade with the United States simply to make money. There is a technology, there is expertise, there is you know, a lot of this strategic aspect of there. But put that aside, decoupling the risk can directly have a risk for the Chinese economy in the sense that on the one hand, high paying corporate jobs are not there. And it created a bigger incentive mismatch between college graduate, highly educated Chinese young people versus the job market. They realized that, you know what, my parents told me to study harder so that I can eventually get a high paying job. And now it turned out that when I graduate, not only the jobs are no longer there, but I probably have to be, I have to take a pay cut. And on the other hand, the government is literally telling everybody, you need to do vocational training and you want, we want you to do advanced manufacturing jobs. You know what, the youth are simply not going to buy it. So this is the framework that I think through, you know, the debt, demographics, a debt demand, demographics, and decoupling. And a lot of these four Ds generate a lot of deflationary pressure to the Chinese economy. Uh, but I, I'm, not thinking that the China, I'm not saying that the Chinese economy is becoming Japan in the sense that, well, it has a lot of technical issues with the pork price. So you, in order to correctly understand whether China is moving into te deflationary territory or not, well, we have to track the cycles of pork price. L let, me, let me quickly um, just ask, pick up on your, your fourth D um, and, and get you to just give us a sense of where you think we are in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, November... President Xi and President Biden met in, in San Francisco that was widely taken to be, um, uh, to reflect an acknowledgement on the parts of both governments that things had gotten too tense, that things were too unstable, and that there was a need to uh, stabilize things even if the ceiling on the relationship was much lower than it was. D do you think we are truly in a kind of more stable framework now, or is this merely a kind of lull in tensions that we're likely to see blow up again in the, in the months ahead? Yeah, that's a really nice way to, 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 to put the question. Um, I, I, re I honestly, I do not think the U.S.-China relationship is, is, is in its uh, in a stable relationship because anything could potentially blow, blow up. It could be another spy balloon. It could be another cyber attack traced back to the Chinese Communist Party or state-sponsored activities. Uh, and it could be related to something like a TikTok. <laughs> the Chinese government is literally putting out a strong, a strong voice against it. Um, but I do think the Xi Jinping Biden meeting, Biden Xi Jinping meeting uh, in, uh, in, uh, on the sideline of uh, a San Francisco APAC is a reset to pre Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. That's as good as I can give it. Um, and all, the colleague, all our professors here can rate whether that is a performance in terms of A, B, C, or F. Uh, but that's you know, as far as I can go, pre Nancy Pelosi's visit. And uh, the relationship is still very much fragile, both in terms of economics, in terms of uh, technology. And it pre you ask Nate the question with regard to you know, whether promoting democracy should, is now a centerpiece of, the, of US foreign policy. And you know what, viewing from China's point of view, 
as long as the United States is not promoting democracy, as long as there is no perception of peaceful evolution, that's good for China. Uh, but I do think the shift towards promoting industrial policies and in particular the active use of development financing institutions such as development finance, uh, the DF's Development Finance Corporation and the alliance between DFC and the Japan Bank for International Japan Bank J Japan Bank for International Corporation and the the Korean Import Export Bank a lot of this seems to have this counter China alliance mm -hmm. giving China at least give Chinese policymakers a lot of word again towards domestic audience in China to say well you see America is waging a technology economic cold war against us you, you nicely set up the one question I want to ask all three of you before I go to questions from all of you, and that's about TikTok. Uh, all of you work on social media in one form or another on the U.S.-China relationship. So let me just ask a very simple question. Do you think the, the legislation to either force a sale or ban TikTok in the United States is a good idea? Is it something the U.S. should do? Nate, I'll start with you. I'm, I'm really glad you didn't say yes or no, because uh, I'm taking a simple question. To make. So I think there's two things in this question, two, two things that have to be done. So there's one thing that has to happen, which is that we have to understand that TikTok is an actual unique threat. I think that's real. I think there's, there, are, there are aspects of this conversation in the United States that have discounted that and discounted the actual threat that comes from the, 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 the possibility, which isn't proven, and that's where a lot of the debate has been, but the possibility that TikTok could be used to, in a crisis especially, to advance narratives mm -hmm. in the United States. So, so you're, you're worried about the algorithm, not the data in that case, especially. Uh, well, that's the second part, I wanna to get to that. But I think, that, but yeah, to advance, to, so say there's a natural disaster, or say there's a war with Taiwan, um, between China and, and Taiwan, um, and all of a sudden we find out, actually, yo, TikTok can be directed, right? Um, this is not the time to find that out. You can't afford to find that out then, to be frank. Um, so I do think there's an important element there. The second part that I think is, is, is the other part that you were speaking about is that you know, social media itself is a issue that US policymakers have not addressed broadly. We're actually seeing more progress in the European Union where they have lower stakes in terms of where the companies are housed um, in terms of democratic policymaking around what would it look like to regulate social media platforms in a democratic way. Um, there's the Digital Services Act, which is the, the large uh, package of bills that has been implemented and is now coming fully into force uh, this year. Um, and, and we need these kinds of steps. We need data privacy legislation, comprehensive data privacy legislation. We need steps to uh, force the platforms into transparency measures that they have done, sometimes done voluntarily, but now many of them have rolled back in terms of access to algorithms, access to the APIs, um, so that researchers can study how they're doing these things. We need both sides of that. So I think in some ways, you know, this particular bill I won't speak to. Um, the divestment aspect of that I think is very difficult to imagine for a lot of practical reasons. Um, but at, at bottom, I, I think it's real. I think we need a solution for TikTok, but we also need a solution for this larger issue that a lot of policy has not wanted to take up. All right. Everything he said. <laughs> In addition, um, a couple of things. Um, one, we've been lazy on hate across the board. Um, I've just I described to you what was taking place in some in a tiny little way on what's happening online. TikTok is one piece of that, but his second point about the algorithms, what's actually taking place, the protection of young people, for goodness sake. I mean, we have been so slow, um, and I'd call it lazy, on getting serious about what really is taking place. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I, so I, I really think it's part of a larger conversation we have to have about social media platforms, period. I think the piece about um, foreign uh, influence at a time of danger is a really uh, exceptionally important one. And, and I, I'd go one, one step further. I, I think that we, did, we misunderstood the, the beginning of social media. We misunderstood how bad it could really be. I mean, we didn't really imagine the worst. We all sweetly went into this thinking, oh, it's going to bring the world together and isn't that sweet? And the CEOs of those companies said that and we bought it, line, hook, and sinker. And I don't get it because we're not, um, we are sophisticated, we understand how technology works. We also understand how, how humans work. And if you give people an opportunity to get tribal, guess what, they, go, they become tribal. 
to marry that with what you were saying about the decrease in pluralism, the democracy, all of those larger societal things. We have an obligation today to ask harder questions than we have ever asked before about the nature of society and who we want to be as humans on planet Earth. And it, it, I'm not being dramatic here. It is part of the larger question. So I think it is really critical that we get serious about what we're doing. The, the, what's happening in Europe is that they've taken this uh, in a serious way. They've been adults about the whole thing. Um, it may not be the perfect answer. It will get better and better as the years go forward. But what are we doing in the United States? We're kicking back and just waiting for somebody else to do this for us. I think it's time to get real. Sorry. Um, you know, like, um, I think Farah had made a speak from a philosophical point of view, and I would like, you know, um, lower, uh, lower a level and think from an economic point of view. I do think, you know, social media platforms like TikTok, they do have an empowering function in terms of, like, you know, empowering uh, and to drive small businesses. So I think there are your theory, but, but, but that does not mean I think it's all good. The part that I think we should, uh, rather than focusing on one particular social media platform, what we really need to focus on is about counter misinformation. And I do think that is a problem, especially now it put a lot of pressure and a lot, a high, perhaps a higher degree of requirement, perhaps for uh, university professors and educators, because uh, at least when I teach, at, when I teach uh, at Columbia, I do encounter the problem of some of my students have hard time, especially the younger, younger student who did not have work experience. They find it difficult to distinguish facts versus opinions. Therefore, in, at least in this spring semester, I had, I, I, I dedicated 30 minutes at least to teach people, like, you know, this is how you need to separate facts versus opinions. And you can write an, an essay full of, you know, opinions, but hey, my opinion doesn't matter, your opinion could matter, uh, but because I care about <laughs> evaluation. <laughs> uh, uh, but you need to give me facts to support your opinions. And uh, if you wanted to use ChatGPT to write an essay, I can use ChatGPT Chat to grade you. <laughs> so from that perspective, I do think you know, a lot of this counter misinformation uh, campaign, the government needs to do a lot. Social media platform companies, they need to do self-regulation. But again, a lot of it put a lot of responsibilities and requirement and perhaps pressure for educators as well. So hopefully, you know, you will bring, you, you will give, give this country, you will empower this country, a newer generation of people who are better informed. I'm tempted to go back to all of you for a yay or nay vote on the legislation. No. <laughs> I, will not, I will not do that. Um, we'll go to questions from all of you. Um, let me just remind you to stand. Um, there's a microphone coming around and state your name and affiliation as you're asking a question. And if you would like to direct the question to anyone in particular, please, please do that. So we'll start um, with this gentleman over here. Hi, I'm Michael Stramiska from SUNY Orange in New York State. My question for uh, Farah Pandit. When you spoke about the threat, the worldwide threat of violent extremism, at one point you mentioned that there's a threat on the right and the left. And I have to say, I have trouble seeing where the violent extremist threat on the left is, because there seems to be so much more happening on the right. So could you enlighten me on that point? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I will tell you that um, the Southern Poverty Law Center is an amazing place to go to actually learn about all the different types of extremist groups that exist in our country and around the world. And rather than giving you a lecture on um, the differences and the, um, the depth of some of these groups, I would urge you to take a look and see how they manifest. But I will answer your question. I'm not dodging you. Um, uh, I, I do want to say um, I was asked the question about um, how people learn uh, from the United States and, and overseas. And I neglected to say that it isn't just an extremist group per se. But it also is um, conspiracy theories that motivate people to do things. So for example, you will all remember QAnon, that is an American, um, you know, we, it came, came from here. It was developed here. It was a conspiracy that, was, that took shape here. Um, and you saw people marching in the streets in Japan um, who were adherents for this conspiracy. This opportunity for a generation to be connected to each other, 
means that whether you are, are whatever, whatever um, extremist group you belong to, whatever ideological function you take part in, you have the ability to inspire. And so I would say to you on this issue of the violent far left and the violent far right, that each of those tribes, each of those movements, each of those cohorts have activated and inspired people all over the world and in all parts of our country to do violent things. In the post-October 7th moment that we found ourselves in when Hamas did the horrific thing, I didn't even talk about anti-Semitism and the growth of anti-Semitism in our country since October 7th. It is horrendous. 600, sorry, 377% increase of anti-Semitism since October 7th. Anti-Muslim hate has grown exponentially. During the COVID years, I'm telling the audience what you already know, the rise of AAPI hate was off the charts. One in two people from the AAPI community are afraid to go out because they're for fear of being attacked. Things have shifted. How those things are shifted means that groups have message. They have been out there. They're not necessarily violent, not necessarily <laughs> violent, but their inspiration and their ideology pushes people in a direction. Um, I will say to you finally, um, on the violent far left, people respond, you're not the only person who has responded this way when I say that. You suddenly feel like, what is she saying? What is she talking about? But there are groups in the United States today, in the post-October 7th um, period of time, that have promoted violence because of their position on the attack of Hamas on Israel. And there have been violence that has happened because of that. People have been hurt because of this. Synagogues have been attacked because of this. So I just, I want to, I want to just, I don't want to, take over the conversation talking about the Hamas-Israel um, situation, but I want to say, let's be clear-eyed about what's happening in our nation uh, on the violent far right, on the violent far left, things in the middle, <laughs> and a whole bunch of things that we don't talk about every single day. Go to the Southern Poverty Law Center for a place to, to learn more. Go to the Anti-Defamation okay. <laughs> okay. Anti League to learn about ADL. Go to the Institute for Strategic Dialogue to learn about anti-Muslim hate and anything else you want to learn about. Nate, let me, let me just give you a chance to add anything since you worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center <laughs> uh, a couple years uh, ago. I did, although that would, yeah, I'm not sure I can speak. I did work there uh, at the Intelligence Project um, as Deputy Director of the Intelligence Project a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know that I have uh, anything particular to add to what Farah has said, except that um, obviously violent extremism and, and extremist hate in the United States is a constellation. I mean, there are, and there are, I think, um, combinations of ideologies and combination, what we see is combinations, I guess, of ideologies. Um, Anti-Semitism, um, you'll see this in the way SPLC writes about anti-Semitism particularly. Anti-Semitism is kind of a foundational ideology across many different, uh, foundational hate ideology, to be clear, uh, across many different ways of, of conspiratorial ways of thinking and conspiratorial ways of approaching the world. Um, and that can then manifest in many different directions. Um, and without going Far, far down that hole, I would say that it's a, it's a kind of a core ideology that many share, if not all. Uh, there was a question. We have, we have three at this front table, so um, <laughs> we'll, we'll start with the far left and we'll, 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 make, our, we'll make our way down. Yes. Oh, you want to, okay. You want Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eunice King, and I'm from Vanguard University of Southern California. Uh, thank you so much for all your comments tonight. Very enlightening. Uh, my question is to Nate. I taught a comparative politics uh, class recently. We looked at like the quality of democratization and um, really interested in Freedom House, like how you measure democracy. One of the questions that my students asked, and, um, and I would love for you to answer it, <laughs> is you have X number of uh, factors that measure democracy. Uh, how many is it real quick? Is it like? Uh, it depends on how you're, you know, there's sub questions within the different, there, there's like, uh, I guess eight different categories, each of which have between four and six sub Okay, all right, like so that. approximately eight, but maybe uh, four different, 32 yeah. um, right. factors or so. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, do you rate them equally? I, I wanted to know about the, the sure. weighting system. Um, and if you do weight it equally, um, and I, my understanding is that it is weighted equally, the factors, well, shouldn't, um, uh, 
elections, shouldn't competitive elections, shouldn't freedom of speech or freedom of press be weighted more uh, more heavily than um, than other factors? And I would love for you to comment a bit on the U.S. My understanding is that the U.S. is rated ranked 30 out of um, or, or pro around 30 out of you know 200 countries and other countries that have a shorter history of democracy than the United States are ranked higher than us and so could you comment a bit on you know how you know the US is um, is is ranked lower than other countries in terms of democracy when we're supposed to be I guess the the beacon of, of democracy around the world and the waiting system a bit thank you so much sure. yeah um, great question, uh, and I'm happy to speak about it. Um, the methodology, for those who are interested, you know, there's a lot of information online. There's a very vigorous debate going on, including in the last 12 months in the political science and democracy studies community about uh, measuring democracy um, with some really interesting uh, discussions at, at the American Political Science Association uh, annual meeting that one of my colleagues, who's not here tonight, but she participated in. Um, we do weight equally, so I mean, we have the, the the process that Freedom House does. Just I could go under the hood if you guys want. Um, we, we might have that, to save that for the appendix part of yeah, this conversation. Fair. Uh, yeah, fair. Yeah. Uh, is that is that we we basically look at each of these countries through its own review process. So we assess across the same set of uh, indicators and and scoring questions. Uh, typically, it's a zero to four scale for each question, each sub indicator, and. That gives you this total number of points, 100 points. Um, there's an additional question which can go into the negatives for forced ethnic change. Um, but essentially, that means that we do this kind of, it's, it's a dialogue process. It's, an, it's kind of an argumentative, discursive process within Freedom House with outside experts um, who are incorporated into the process. Um, and yes, they are equally weighted. I mean, it it's essentially comes down to making methodological choices, right, about if you want to weight something else, what are you going to uh, what are you going to put underweight? If you're going to put something overweight, what are you going to put underweight? How are you going to justify that? I think there's a lot of different valid ways to go about doing that. There are more minimal, as you raise the question of elections, there are more minimal definitions for doing this, right? Which is, is there a free and fair election? Great, zero to one. There's some political scientists who will argue that's all we need to do, right? Or will argue we need to just look at freedom of expression, freedom of the press, you know, are journalists in jail? Maybe that's an easier way. There was a very interesting debate about this in the last year. You know, is that just a faster, more accurate way to do this? From our perspective, the exercise is kind of the point. So like the, the discussion of it, the evaluation and the discussion is to produce this debate about which measures are valid and which parts are, you know, what, what does democracy consist of? So this, it, I, get, I, I get that's a little meta, but like, that's kind of what we're going for, is we want to talk about these different factors and say, yeah, we included uh, uh, you know, unequal treatment of groups, and in the US's case, specifically the abuse of people who've tried to enter the United States uh, without status and the way that they're treated in the immigration system. And we do include that within our measure of democracy. We think that's important. And we did that for every country in the world. You know, And yeah, sure, if we want to debate that and say that's not a part of democracy, fine, let's debate it. But we, we think it is. Um, for the US, yeah, um, ranking, I mean, we don't explicitly rank, so we're not, we're not trying to say necessarily like 30th out of anything, but yeah, I mean, they, it does produce a numeric outcome and you can do a comparison. Um, I know we're frequently, I think right around the same area, you're gonna get Poland, you're gonna get Romania, um, you know, and you'll frequently see it in the American press, these kind of like, ugh, can't believe America is in the same bracket as Poland or Romania or something. That seems kind of unfair to me, to Poland and Romania. Um, <laughs> well, I just think it's a little insulting. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, it's kind of condescending, right? Um, I think that the, the issues in the United States are very serious. I mean, as I said at the beginning, I think the issues are very serious. We've seen very serious declines, nine points in the last decade. Um, that that nine points, by the way, you know, spanned across multiple administ presidential administrations and different, you know, rotations of Congress. Um, so it's it's been kind of underlying a large number of things, and I think that some of the things we've raised here, including the polar, the kind of polarization, is a shorthand, and I don't always know it's the most accurate shorthand for what it is, but you can use it as a shorthand for a bigger societal process that's been happening of sorting and of um, conflict within the society that is then pursuing a bunch of very concrete political outcomes. 
like manifesting through the US uh, political system, particularly in the legislative system and then the judicial system and the kind of like, you know, changes in the Supreme Court as well as then that's reflected in whether parts of society accept those changes essentially, right, and see the rulings as valid. Um, there's a whole, it's a whole big mess. Um, and I do think it's very serious. Um, it is, and again, to, to go to that point about free countries and partly free countries decline, this is an unusual decline. So I made this point about, well, free and partly free countries have only declined by 1% on average. Obviously, you can do the math. It's a 100-point scale. The U.S. has gone down by 9, so that's 9%. We're an outlier in, that, in this category, right? We're driving that average down. Um, let's go to with the uh, middle of the front table. Yeah. Hi there, thank you all. Uh, I'm Mark Rush, I'm from Washington on the University. And I hope I can articulate this question well because I thought everything was going just fine till the very end. <laughs> when I thought I, I saw this juncture, on the one hand, uh, Nate, we're talking about Freedom House says the need, there's a need to promote democracy, beat back authoritarianism and whatnot. And if you think about authoritarianism, perhaps reduced, you know, centralized executive power, cut back on deliberative democracy, maybe constrain rights some, more than we're accustomed to. Okay, fine, avoid that. But on the other hand, we finished up talking about we need to do something about TikTok. Hmm. Every punk with a server who can promote hate around the world, and so on and so forth. And so, on the one hand, we need to promote democratization of power. Sorry. We need to promote democratization of power. On the other hand, to solve these gl global challenges, we need to promote centralization of power, seemingly at the expense, perhaps, of private liberties. Who's going to, Elon Musk could theoretically have shut down part of the war in Ukraine, according to New Yorker a while back. How do we go after the hate mongers living in their parents' basements, hidden somewhere that we can't even find them, right, without giving government a lot more power than it currently has? So it seems there's a tension between the two. If you want to beat back the problems that the world seems to be suffering, maybe we need to centralize government power at the expense of a tremendously successful democratization of power over the last half century. I hope that's reasonably coherent. Thank you all. Far, do you want to I wrote start an with entire it? book <laughs> about that exact thing, how we win. How do we do this? We have figured out ways of putting guardrails on all kinds of things, including how we manage the internet. If we didn't have guardrails on, all you would see when you Google is pornography. We've made, and it's true, we've made choices. We make choices every single day on how to keep people safe, online and offline. We are capable of doing that here too. In no possible way can any government on earth, whether it is the United States, Poland, France, China, they cannot control everything. In order for us to see a decrease in extremism and hate, it has to be every component of society that is activated. You all have such an essential role to play in the way in which you're teaching your students about how digital literacy, how they understand exactly what you were saying, what's real, what isn't. What democracy even is, we don't teach civics anymore, you know? So I'm not being cute when I say that each government should do more. There are things that we can do in terms of putting guardrails on, but society needs to do a whole lot more too. And I mean the <coughs> private sector, I mean the public, the not-for-profit sector, I mean funders. Um, there are things that we can do right now. And, and the solutions are available and affordable as we speak right now. It's just that we haven't focused on the soft power aspects. We keep thinking that somebody else is going to do it. Well, guess what? We have two generations since 9-11 who have been uh, exposed to I ideologies that we never thought they could be exposed to and have reacted to it in this way. Did we ever imagine, and by the way, sir, they're not living in the basement of somebody's mother, whatever that whole thing is. They're down the street at Starbucks or you know, walking down the street on their phones. They're in prime, they're, I mean, I'm just Fair saying enough. to you, I understand, yeah. but, it's, but I'm saying that to you, it's out in the open. And it's people who are not hiding, they know what they're doing, they're making money, they're getting power, and they are really successful at it. For us to be able to decrease and diminish hate and extremism in our country and around the world, it means that our citizens need to demand that our societies act differently, that we're more compassionate, 
they were more civil. And I'm not, I'm not saying that is going to, the switch is going to be changed. But if you have a sixth grader who is willing to go online and to take a look at Atomwaffen's ideology about purity and feel like, hey, that connects to me and I'm going to go get my mom's gun and I'm going to go do something about it, we have a problem. So at every level, influencers and cultural icons can make a difference, as well as parents in the home, as well as teachers and so on. Zoe, let me just go to you very quickly because that, I mean, you'd ask a very different version of that question if we were, if we were talking about Chinese regulation of technology and social media. Just g give us a very quick sense of where the debate on these questions of regulation and centralization uh, fit into Chinese policy at the moment. I think, first of all, the, the, the center of the conversation, I guess, is very different in the sense that, uh, I guess, China in, in, in the international space, there is a state-sponsored so-called Five Cents Party, or Wu Dang. The idea is there is state-employed forces that can provide a counter-argument. And then on the other hand, as Farrell was talking about, you need a society to demand it. And in the Chinese, in the Chinese case, the demand is really about, yes, you, you see this in Chinese TV shows. They understand the need, there are societal demand to say you need to have real name, uh, real name internet censorship. It doesn't matter who who is regulating that, but Chinese people get very frustrated with the experience of the high frequency. Uh, perhaps it has a lot to do with the large number of population, but the high frequency of hatred, internet-generated hatred, uh, that's basically fit into what Farrell was talking about, societal demand for regulation. Um, I think there was a question. Let, let, me go, let me go to the far back first, and then I'll come back uh, this way. Um, thank you for inviting me and for putting this on. I'm uh, Barbara Logan. I'm from the University of Wyoming. This is a question for Dr. Liu. Um, since you're talking about censorship and sort of a state-recognized um, concept of benefit from this, which is um, just your personal analysis, what do you think um, the movers and shakers and China's government uh, believe that they would achieve uh, with the conquest of Taiwan? Is it, I mean, normally <coughs> wars are expensive and not going to help your GDP much, um, especially since people see the saber rattling and they move into their own production, um, localized production of CPUs and things like that, uh, versus is it really just about this, the, the, cap the capacity of soft power or propaganda to have a larger effect um, and to sort of distract the population that potentially is younger and has all these difficulties moving into the workforce and getting married and having it, your three children um, now um, and uh, sort of doing what the government wants. Do you think it, that there's some vision in fact of some kind of economic benefit or do you think it is something else entirely that would be more motivating towards GDP? Thank you for the question. I guess I'll, I'll first start by answering that, uh, I'll, by, by answering referen in reference to one of my four Ds, which is demographics. I think uh, in order for the Chinese Communist Party to mobilize uh, a war against Taiwan militarily, it is going to be a hell of uh, social mobilization. And the reason is because more than 80% of the PLA combat forces, they are the so-called one-child generation, uh, we can debate about the timeline, their, the, the lack of or the existence of it, but the fact that they are the 80%, higher than 80% of the PLA composition is the so-called one-child generation simply means that A, the grandmas, the great grandmas, and the parents are going to be very against the idea of sending their only child to go to war, whether it's a son or a daughter. And then secondly, if you have this one-child generation, whether it's a son or a daughter, being the only person in the family line to carry it down the family generation, it is very difficult to mobilize. And then thirdly, it goes back to your GDP point of view, uh, obviously yeah, risking, the, risking, risking uh, losing the war, not just uh, accelerating the, the collapse of, of President Xi Jinping's power, but also it is very detrimental to China's GDP growth in the long term, right? Um, but fundamentally, uh, you know, to what ex I, I guess, Xi Jinping, President, Xi, President or General, Party General Secretary Xi Jinping and the whole Chinese 
uh, Communist Party hierarchy, we, we learned two important things from uh, Russia's, uh, President Putin's war against Ukraine. The first one is uh, they need to prepare the Chinese economy in order to do the very important economic condition to uh, wage a war against Taiwan if the identity part of assimilation part, cultural assimilation fails. The first part they need to do, the, the economic condition, is that they need to sanction prove the Chinese economy so that sanctioning China, Western collective sanction against China is going to be at least equally costly to the sanctioners. And China has been developing an alternative trading system and an alternative renminbi-based financial system to do that. Although we can argue that they did, did, they did the system not for the purpose of uh, uh, to, to dodge sanctions, but they have that possible, uh, function. And then the second part is he needs to prepare the PLA by anti-corruption, and we have already seen that uh, in, in action. But neither of neither demographics nor sanction proof the Chinese economy nor anti corruption neither of these can be achieved anytime soon. And then I'll conclude by saying that I've talked with many Chinese uh, visitors as well as policymakers. I asked them about the timeline of 2027, and none of them said, uh, you know, concretely like there is any piece of concrete document to say that's actually the war game plan. I'm sorry to those we didn't get to, but I know that at least a um, couple of the speakers will be at dinner, so you, uh, I'm sure they would not mind if you uh, buttonhole them um, and, uh, and ask any follow-up questions. Um, before dinner, let me remind you um, that you are due to arrive here at 8.30 tomorrow morning for breakfast, um, and please be sure to bring your lanyards and name tags so they don't have to print them again. <laughs> um, and uh, before, uh, before dinner, please thank Nate and Far and Zoe for rich conversation. Thank you guys. <laughs>